Well, uh, karibu ni sana wapendwa uh, uh, elder uh, our brother Kimaru uh, from Nyeri. Karibu sana na ndugu Mungu akubariki ndugu yangu. Uh, how are you doing? Perhaps uh, Elder Kimaru has a little bit of some technical issues there, but we are hoping that he is hearing what I'm saying. Um, uh, Sister uh, Mama Charles, um, I can see you there. And um, indeed, uh, you are struggling to we 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 probably asking that uh, you great yeah now I'm sure you can be able to hear us uh, clear and karibuni sana karibuni sana brother Samuel before karibu sana uh, elder Kimaru from Nyeri you want to say something asante sana asante sana amena Hi, Michelle. How are you? We are together. Thank you, God. Amen. I'm glad. We we are we are starting off at in a few minutes time. In a few minutes time, we're starting off, and we desire to uh, continue our studies. Uh, rather our uh, discussion in this what I call the work seminar. Uh, it's an open discussion, so I'm hoping that you all be blessed. Okay. Okay. Um, I would want us to to have uh, perhaps a word of prayer from uh, Elder Kimaru. I'm hoping that perhaps there are some of us who will be joining um, in the course of time because perhaps some of them went to work or something like that. But we'll, we'll get going, studying and discussing these things. So what we're going to do as we wait for the rest is to start with a word of prayer from one of our elders, uh, uh, our brother Daniel. So please, if you don't mind, pray for us. Uh, I hope you are hearing me. Yes, we can. Hello. Tunakupata vyema. Okay. Hebu na tuombe. Mtakatifu baba utupedae sana. Tunakushukuru kwa sababu ya kuwa pamoja nasi tagu mkutano wa jana mpaka siku ya leo. Na wakati huu tunakuanza mkutano huu. Tunataka kuelimika ili kusudi tuweze kuwa na msimamo nzuri katika kweli. Hebu roho wako mtakatifu atuongoze na yule ambaye anaongoza baba mtumie kama shauba ili zote tuweze kufanikiwa 
kuwa na imani moja itakao tusaidia kuweza kupatikana katika ufalme wako. Na ni katika Kristo Bwana wetu nimeomba. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much everyone. We are happy to Okay. okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you Elder. And thank you family of Elder James. We are here brother Sam in the Thank you so much. Um we are here to continue with uh, uh, matters which are very important to be uh, harmonized as brethren as we press together, studying the word of God together and sharing the word of God together as far as it's possible. Um, I was not there as of yesterday when we were actually discussing the whole concept of uh, the interpolations that are possible in the book of Matthew chapter 28, verses 19. Uh, which is basically the great commission that Jesus Christ gave to his disciples. And I would have been glad to capture that and then just share what our newer uh, deductions were. But I know we still have a study in, in regard to Matthew 28, verse 19, perhaps on Wednesday, uh, where we have a couple number of people joining us, so that we'll be able to know exactly uh, uh what we should be what should be binding us as, as a people now most of the subjects that we are discussing in this workers uh conference is uh, are subjects that perhaps have brought some division or are appear a little bit controversial because we see things differently but we are sitting together to study together so that the things that we are seeing differently, we can find a way in which we can be able to see them together, see them in the same light. Of course, not whereby we unite by discarding that which is truth and that is light, but rather uniting by seeing things in the light of what the Bible says. Now, today we are looking at the edit in the spirit of prophecy, and I am not preaching. I am simply going to moderate and give you opportunity to say what you are thinking about this subject. But I'll give you just um, a very brief uh, start so that you might be able to understand what this is all about. Um, many a times uh, we come to a point where we uh, stumble on certain paragraphs or lines or quotations within the spirit of prophecy that, um, that are sort of uh, not agreeing with our understanding of certain theological uh, facts. And there is the notion or the concept that when she doesn't say it the way I want it said, then perhaps someone tampered with that particular line. So while it's true that the devil has been wroth and the devil went to make war with the remnant who are this remnant those who keep the commandments of god and have the testimony of jesus christ but way for your information one of the greatest things that is going to be attacked in the end time is going to be the spirit of prophecy so we are not here to discuss all the attacks that have been done in the spirit of prophecy, but we are here to find a balanced view because all of us do agree that there has been a serious attack on the spirit of prophecy because it's one of the identifying marks of the remnant. You remember from, I think it's a book of Hosea chapter 12, if, if all you remember uh, the beautiful text, yeah, Hosea chapter um, 13 or 12. And uh, uh, that's where it says in, um, if you're able to uh, go through Hosea and you can be able to read chapter 12, verse 13, where it basically says, by a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt and by a prophet was he preserved. And, and then so we are talking about the, bringing of Israel out of Egypt through the ministry of a prophet. And then we are 
talking about the preservation of Israel through the ministry of a prophet. So that even when Moses was already dead, the writings of the prophet kept guiding and keeping the remnant, that is the Israelites who are in the wilderness pure, even to the time that they were dwelling in the land of Canaan. And so it's by a prophet that they were both brought out or cut off from the world. Egypt was a symbol of the world. It was by a prophet that they were preserved. And so the much they read of the writings of the prophet, what, what God had given to Moses, the more they understood, together with the testaments given to them direct from God, the will, the command, and the desires of, of Jehovah. So I, I want to suggest that we are all in agreement that what's happening is with the passing of time, there are so many attacks that have been on the spiritual prophecy and that is true and we can give us an opportunity perhaps to cite if you have any evidence of perhaps the areas which have been attacked but another concept that or angle from which you are going to look at this uh, uh, we are going to take this study is also to try to see to what extent is it that everything that perhaps is mentioned in the spiritual prophecy, which does not agree with my, uh, my view, or perhaps a particular movement's view, perhaps prophetic view or doctrinal view, must we straightforward say, hey, that's an addition, it's an insertion, it's, it's, it's inserted, it's the, it's, 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 it's the, it's the, the whole concept is brought in by someone else. And, 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 and perhaps we might need to ask, is it that everything that we don't agree with as having been said there, um, will we look at that particular paragraph or that particular concept in the spirit of prophecy perhaps as something that is uh, was not a light given to the prophet at that time or the child. Where are we going to get the balance? Because we are having scenarios where perhaps me, Brother Zadok, I don't agree with certain concept. And we found this in lots of our studies, brethren, when we are talking about the issue of a flat and the roundup, which we will discuss in a few, a few days. And the whole concept has been, hey, they are not inspired on that. And so we cannot make them. They, are, they cannot be referenced. The Bible is to be a reference. We've had cases uh, in the, uh, the one chicken movement where we have, and which we truly tru tru believe that there is one God and he has one, oh, one only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And we've had the trial sort of quotations which have been looked at by some of us and straightforward, they say, hey, those are inserted. So we are trying to find a balance and we are also medical missionaries. We have found quotations that sometimes we feel like, hey, that's just hitting on some of the principles that I, as a person believe, should be set clear. We found cases where she's recommending certain foods to be used on certain patients or recommending a certain sort of medication which we feel like should not be the case. And it is sometimes like, hey, that is added. Where is the balance? How, how do we come to identify that this is a tampered document and this is the truth? Um, I'll just read one quote from her because we are discussing the spirit of prophecy and the spirit of prophecy explains the spirit of prophecy, but I've given a biblical background that by a prophet, uh, Israel was preserved. By a prophet, Israel was brought out of Egypt. And so the ministry of a prophet in a movement is very important. And we are here having the inspired messenger to the remnant church. We are not going to discuss any issues as to whether uh, she's a prophet, which she's a, a messenger to the remnant church. We all believe as we are here that she is a messenger inspired of God and given messages from heaven to give to 
the church in these last days. Now, I know that there's a common quote that we've read and perhaps that must have been from, uh, uh, that must have been from a little book, um, uh, Testimonies, Volume 5, page, page, page 696, paragraph 1. And that quote says, and now to all who have the desire for the truth, I would say, do not give credence to unauthenticated reports as to what Sister White has done or said or written. If you desire to know what the Lord has revealed to her, read her published works. Read her published works. Are there any points of interest concerning which she has not written? Do not eagerly catch up and report rumors as to what Sister White has said. We, we are there admonished not to, not to actually speak rumors in regard to what Sister White has said. But then that will leave us also with another step in this discussion to discuss to what extent should we reject compilation? Should we entirely reject everything that is compiled? And should we limit ourselves only to the books that were published under the titles which they were published without any alteration in title in page number or perhaps in something of that sort. So that's going to be the scope of our discussion today. I, I, want, I want to leave it really open for us to give our thoughts. Uh, welcome brother Timothy. I want us to continue so that we could, could give our thoughts. Brother Sami, you have your hands up. So I would, I would want to give you the first the opportunity to be able to speak in regard to this as, as, as the discussion just picks up and I'll just be doing a, a bit of moderation. But I'll be giving my opinions as well. Uh, Karibu. No, I don't, I don't think that I have my hand raised up. Maybe later. Okay. <laughs> you know, what happens is like I, I put my caster right <laughs> over you and it's it's sort of a hand raised, so I think that's where I, I got it all wrong. So, continuing, Brown sisters, I don't know if any of you. Um, let's let's begin this way. Let's begin by asking ourselves if uh, we believe that the spirit of prophecy is inspired and is important for the remnant church, because because this is. Um, uh, this should be the basis. This should be the, the, the very foundation so that we are, we are on the same platform. Because I know that there are many people today who, well, it's true that we have to, we have to uphold the Bible and the Bible alone as the only creed in the Seventh-day Adventist movement. But is it true that we can push the statement to an extent that we reject the spirit of prophecy? And has it been rejected by many of our brethren who still prescribe and call themselves up to the Adventists? Is there any, any idea, any thought? Okay. Well, that appears like not taken by anyone. And I'm not sure if I should point out and ask if someone has something to say about this. Karibu uh, brother Timothy uh, to the discussion that we are, we are having. Okay, so uh, we perhaps might not be having something to say because as far as I am concerned, you all agree that she is inspired of God and that writings are sent from heaven because it's actually, as, 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 as it happens in the book of Revelation, just exactly what happens in 
her receiving a, a vision. The father gives it to the son, the son to the angel, the angels to the prophet, the prophet gives it to the people. So writing is basically inspired. But the question should be, do we agree, first of all, that there has been some tampering with her works? And do we have evidence for that? Or are we giving rumors in regard to what you're saying? Uh, thank you, Brother Zadok, for hosting the platform. And uh, uh, I thank the Lord that uh, he can uh, give us an opportunity to be able uh, to share in the things that you're speaking about. And uh, I hope that uh, they'll edify us. I, I just wanted to point out some things in regard to uh, how to maybe use E.G. White uh, materials and uh, the question of uh, authenticity. Uh, as you know very well that uh, Ellen G. White in her lifetime was actually a prolific author and she wrote uh, over 40 books and uh, 5,000 articles and pamphlets. And uh, in addition, we had many unpublished letters, manuscripts and uh, diaries. Uh, and uh, others were uh, reported uh, uh, stenographic uh, sermons at church services and in the conference. And so the, there is uh, an issue, which ones do we take as inspired and uh, that one which is not inspired? Uh, uh, because uh, maybe of the ine inevitable uh, human uh, error, effect to the result of a stenographer's work, Ellen White often will make handwritten notations on some manuscripts to say uh, that she had read and approved them or offered adjustment before they were uh, published, that is before her death. And uh, 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 this is clear when you go to the manuscript and letters, you will find uh, the heading and then you will find there uh, annotation. Annotation really uh, uh, proves that um, she did look at the letter or she did look at what was being said and was able uh, to correct it. Uh, however, there are lots of uh, these uh, stenographer reports that uh, have remained as they were written by these stenographers, but there is no evidence that Ellen White ever read and approved them. And uh, these reports uh, exist largely under the section of someone and talks in the White Estate. The presence of the signature, unless it can be uh, an original handwritten, uh, it's not conclusive that she looked at uh, the matter. Uh, and if it doesn't have a rubber stamp or of her own, then uh, uh, it's not uh, she didn't authenticate it. Uh, and the stenographer just uh, took it and uh, put it uh, in, the, in the manuscript or letters uh, shelf uh, in her life, uh, lifetime. And so without uh, an original hand signed copy, it is impossible to prove that the, 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 uh, she personally actually signed and approved of the transcript. So, some of this transcript may have come into her archives even after her death because she didn't also read everything that uh, the stenographers had to uh, bring into the archive. So the only way or certain way to authenticate that Ellen White signed off an account if she made, it is if she made any notations upon the transcribed manuscript or personally handwritten the document. Without this evidence to authenticate these uh, uh, stenographic reports, summons and talk, we can only have an idea of what she might have said. These reports uh, uh, need to be treated as unauthentic and cannot be used to establish what Ellen White stood for or believed for. More so when you look at the larger scope of her writing, if the statement which is not authenticated or it is not stamped by her really have a conflict uh, with the other materials that uh, uh, she, she herself uh, put a sign on it or authenticated upon it. Uh, maybe to cite an example, uh, to show the unliable uh, to these uh, things, 
uh, is the case that was reported uh, in uh, uh, Battle Creek College. Uh, this is where Ellen White has five manuscripts written by five different uh, scenographers. And so in, in that uh, report at mid afternoon on Monday, the 1st of April uh, in 1901 conference, Ellen White addressed many delegation in the library uh, of the Battle Creek. Uh, and uh, you can find the contents of uh, uh, these uh, materials in uh, manuscript 43. And uh, they, they have even numbered them. It is the same thing by different stenographers, but they have named it manuscript 43, then 43A, 43C, 43D, to, to show what the different stenographers had to report. And so being able to compare these uh, uh, five manuscripts allows us to explore the room of uh, variation of what, what the stenographers uh, really had and received and transcribed of that uh, 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 specific talk. Just uh, uh, this is uh, uh, in, uh, in the MS 43 uh, records as a uh, new power where actually the MS-43 records are as new power, the MS-43B is in agreement with the other manuscripts, uh, they actually write new blood. Another example is where a 43A manuscript says he wants every living soul to deal with this machinery as God's machinery. He wants every soul, uh, he wants every living soul to deal with his machinery as God's machinery. But MA and uh, MS-43, 43D, he says he wants every living soul to deal with his machinery as God's machinery. And at one point, manuscript 43 and 43B says, God wants you to make straight paths for your feet, while manuscript 43A and 43D says, he wants you to make straight paths for your feet. Um, and so you can see the variations uh, 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 that uh, are in this uh, 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 in this manuscript. In another place, actually, he says, uh, she says that uh, uh, one stenographer reports that E.G. White says he wants the Holy Ghost to come in. And uh, when you look at uh, manuscript 43C, she, the stenographer reports he wants the Holy Ghost to, uh, uh, he wants the Holy Ghost to be the king. And so one, what do you do with these five manuscripts that uh, she had as someone talk uh, at uh, the Battle Creek. What you have to do is compare with the other evidence, uh, the weight of other evidence is where uh, uh, Sister White uh, talked about maybe the Holy Spirit and uh, the work of the Holy Spirit and all that stuff. And then the weight of the evidence is what you will carry with yourself at the end of the day. Uh, when you compare those that doesn't have her stamp and her signature with those that have her stamp and her signature. That uh, will be my submission for now. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Sami. What you're saying, uh, if I understand, is that the stenographer's work uh, gives us the general feel of what was going on and what was being seen. And so um, I'm thinking that is very important. And that is also um, something that I concur and agree with, that the stenographer's work but the next question we should be asking ourselves, how, how we identify, which, which you, you've answered partially, um, uh, that a signature, Haraba stamp and so on, were very important. But generally, the stenographer's work, you're saying gives us a general feel of the, of the entire, uh, the concept that is being brought up or presentation, um, the deliberations in those various uh, articles. And you've also brought up a very important um, uh, subject that is uh, worth noticing that our safety, rather than discarding that right, right away as falsehood, is to compare with the weight of evidence that is from the published works, the works which are categorized as authenticated reports, authenticated publication. So we should be able to compare, which, which is uh, what I also understand as a principle which we should use to study the Bible. The Bible unlocks the Bible. So if it appears like one of the writers in the Old Testament appears to contradict with another writer in perhaps another section of the Old Testament, then 
I must be able to compare because the Spirit of God does not contradict itself. So scripture unlocks scripture, and it's important also when we are dealing with the writings of Alan White, you use the same principles before we rush to say, hey, this is this and this is that. We should be able to compare with the weight of evidence. What does she likely say about this topic? And why does it appear like in this section, it appears like she's saying something that's a little bit contrary to the general opinion of perhaps my family or our movement or me as a person. So I am thinking that is very important in the study of the spirit of prophecy. Um, well, I, I hope, I hope, I hope that that adds something to, uh, to our, our store for, for the discussion today. We're talking about the works by stenographers should not be used therefore to define a position. That's what I'm, I'm getting from you. We must back up with, uh, we must back it up with evidence. There's um, Karibu Brother Cyprian. We must back it up with evidences from other authenticated writings, authenticated portions of the spirit of prophecy. And I, I think that is very important to note. So we are not going to use one report, which is a stenographer's work, to establish a view or a belief in one, uh, in one particular line. For example, we are talking about the truth about God. We are not going to use one of the stenographer's view to generalize her view and say, hey, this is what she believed. She believed that there are three beings because there is, there is this in a stenographer's work. No, we are going to, if there is anything from a stenographer's work that does not appear to agree with the bulk of information in authenticated writings, then we are going to compare it with the bulk of the truth that she has and most probably interpret it in the light of uh, the bulk of the truth which is given. So uh, that is in, uh, I'm so thankful for the summit, that is in respect to the works which are uh, done by the stenographers, which is, which is really helpful to, to, to us. Now, uh, I would want us to continue. Now, we, we, we at least have been able to explore the uh, our concept, the idea of where we have stenographers uh, work against the published works. Let me, let me talk a little bit about uh, compilation. Now, for those who are just coming in, we, we, are, we are having uh, this old concept, which I feel is right, that the stenographer's work is not going to be used as a singled out uh, uh, as source to define her position. They are going to be compared with the weight of evidence from the other published works. But again, it's my feeling, brethren, that we are not going to discard the whole summons and talks by Sister White and say, hey, it's trash because it's from the stenographers. I don't think it's right. I think that there are concepts that they are bringing home, but we cannot use them singly to define a doctrinal position of the prophet or the pioneer church. But what do we say about compilation? Perhaps that, that might be also a point to talk about. Um, I'm going to welcome views. Um, anyone who has something to say about compilation? Maybe, brother Zadok, as uh, people think about uh, giving in some views on compilation, uh, the question is, have there been changes in SOP before we even go into com com compilation? There is, a, there is a serious charge to bring an SOP, but uh, sometimes I wonder when people say there are some changes in SOP. Yes, we cannot be naive that the devil is at work, but um, 
sometimes if you tell somebody you are saying there's changes in SOP, can you even point out to one change that you find in SOP? You will find that uh, many are naysayers. They don't have any evidence that uh, there is a change in SOP. But uh, uh, I, I like us to point to something that um, uh, should be of uh, a great consideration when, when we are talking about um, uh, changes. Let, let not people just say that there's changes in SOP and when you actually ask them, what is the change? Can you point to one? Most of the Adventists will never point you to any change that uh, actually has happened in SOP. Uh, but I, I, I want to say this. When you look at uh, the preface of uh, of uh, of uh, all writing and uh, selected messages book one, the trustees admit that there are changes. But what kind of changes are they talking about? When you look at the preface of uh, early writing, uh, they say footnotes giving dates and explanations and appendix giving two very interesting brims which were mentioned but not related in the original work. So the original work of early writing, it had it did not have some account related, but now they are added in the uh, uh, in the new version of uh, early writing, and then they give. Uh, historical dates accurately so that uh, people may know uh, the circumstances and when these things occurred. That is something that occurs in the book early writing, the changes of, uh, 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 of uh, the historical uh, dates and explanation under the circumstances that uh, happened at that uh, uh, point. And then what happens again in early writing, the, tr the, the trustees admit that there is occasional employment of new word or change uh, in the construction of a sentence to better express the idea and no portion of the work has been omitted. So no work is omitted, uh, but uh, there is a change of a new word or a change in the construction of a sentence to better uh, the idea and the portion of the work that has been omitted. One thing that also makes people say that there's changes in SOP is uh, the preface of uh, Selected Messages Book 1. When you read the portion of uh, uh, Selected Messages Book 1, uh, we are told that um, uh, while, uh, uh, while there is not a general call for republication of all the articles in their entirety, there is a desire to have a choice group of articles devoted largely to doctrinal subjects to be presented in the completeness of uh, coverage. And so uh, they take uh, from E.G. White's writing uh, a, a particular subject and put it in a book so that um, if you want a, a book on hygiene, you may find this is the book. If you want a subject on this, you may find this is the book. If you want the subject on the sanctuary, you, may, you might have uh, uh, such and such a book. And the White Estate admits that uh, there are few exceptions where there where there were large segments of an article that were not closely related to the doctrinal presentation. And in these cases, deletions have been made and indicated in the usual way. And so you find that um, there is not um, the whole scope and context, his historical context in the compilation and in the change of the book, but they have picked something from the middle of uh, E.G. White's original material put their heading and then uh, uh, inserted there a paragraph, which they um, admit it's a change. And people point at that and say, oh, this is a change. And so there comes a notion that uh, there was a, 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 a motive behind who was doing that. And that can be found in the book of evangelism also, which uh, maybe we'll talk about. The, the last thing I want to point out is um, the change in the book Great Controversy from the original one. The original Great Controversy is what um, you know it's called the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4. That is the original Great Controversy. And uh, there is a significant change in the later editions. Uh, 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 and uh, if you have your 4SP, you can open uh, 200, page uh, 232, paragraph 2 why the change was there and they admit why they were doing such a changes. Uh, in 4SP, which is the original uh, 
a great controversy. It says that the term Babylon derived from Babel and signifying confusion is applied in scripture to various forms of false or apostate religion. But the message announcing the fall of Babylon must apply to some religious body that was once pure and has become corrupt. It cannot be the Romish church, which is here meant for that church has been in a fallen condition for many centuries. But how appropriate the figure as applied to the Protestant churches, all professing to derive their doctrines from the Bible, yet divided into almost innumerable sects. The unity for which Christ prayed does not exist. Instead of one Lord, one faith, one baptism, there are numberless conflicting creeds and theories. Religious faith appears so confused and discordant that the world know not what to believe as truth. God is not in all this, it is the work of man. Now that portion of uh, the original great controversy, which is 4SP, it doesn't appear anywhere in uh, the late editions of uh, the great controversy, but we'll find that they have really uh, 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 um, cut into pieces that paragraph and inserted it in various positions in the later editions. Why did they have to do this? Uh, because one of the points is because that uh, it really could have pointed to Seventh-day Adventists uh, uh, and their later uh, uh, behavior with uh, the term Babylon. But also there is a, a, a report that is given why they did this by Willie White himself. Uh, Willie White says that Sarah Peck, an education spo uh, specialist, joined Ellen White staff at the turn of the century. And one of the assignments that uh, Sister White gave her uh, was um, uh, uh, to divide the materials into two groups. And uh, this assignment was to divide the materials into two groups. Uh, uh, that is um, what we call the uh, materials appropriate for the church and those suitable for the public. And so when this material were being prepared, these uh, omissions were done. Those in fell SP that uh, really attacked Adventism, it was left for Adventists to read them as 4SP. But for the book that was going out, that is uh, the later editions, it was deleted. And in that deletion, actually, they were inserted in various places. And then it went to, uh, the, uh, to the public to be read. And it didn't go as uh, 4SP, but it went as uh, the great controversy. And so uh, Willie White says that while uh, helping her mother in 1911, great controversy, uh, 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 she wrote to the publication committee that uh, in Great Controversy Volume uh, 4, published in 1885, in the chapter Snares of Saturn, uh, there are three pages or more of matter that were not used in the later editions, which were prepared to be sold on the multitudes by our conversers. And he says that it is most excellent and interesting reading for Sabbath keepers, but it's points out the work that Satan will do in persuading popular minister and church members to elevate the Sunday Sabbath and to persecute Sabbath keepers. It was not left out because it was less true in 1888 than in 1885, but because mother thought it was not wisdom to say these things to the multitudes to whom the book will be sold in future years. So with reference to this and other passages in her writings which have been uh, omitted in later edition, she has often said these statements are true and they are useful to our people, but to the gen general public for whom this book is now being prepared, they are out of place. Christ of, of even, Christ said even to his disciples, I have many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. And Christ taught his disciples to be wise as serpent and harmless as doves. Therefore, as it is uh, probable that more souls will be won to Christ by the book without this passage than with it. Let it be omitted, says Sister White. So regarding the changes in forms of expression, uh, uh, E.G. E. White says that essential truth must be plainly told, but so far as possible, they should be told in a language that will win rather than actually offend. And so be, and uh, uh, one time she was preparing the materials for the uh, for, for the science of the time and for the review and herald. And when she made the material, she had to do the same material twice. 
And so, however, preparing them for the review was much easier than preparing article for the science because when preparing the material for the review, it was for mainly for Seventh Day Adventist, and she didn't have to mince her words. But while preparing for the materials for the science, it was for the general public, and she had to omit other things. So when you you start reading such a things, you say, "Oh, the spirit of prophecy has been edited." But uh, people do not belabor to go back to where they are quoted originally and see what is there. And then uh, I can say in quotes, accuse the E.G. White Estate Trustees of changing E.G. White's materials. I think, Brother Zadok, we should become more mature in what we are doing. That uh, we will not just throw statements here and there that uh, 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 the estate has been changed and all that stuff has been changed. But uh, if we are called in the court of law, can we be able to give evidence that this has been removed or this has not been removed? And how I'm praying that our people will stop being followers of people and start reading things for themselves. Thank you, brother. Thank you, uh, brother Sam, for your submissions. I, I don't know if there is any other person who would like to uh, make their submission in regard to that point uh i want to uh be sure that uh, anyone who has a thought uh yeah we we are thankful for that uh brother cpn and this was the first quote that i read and i would read it again from brother cyprian and now to all who have decided to know the truth i would say do not give credence to the dedicated reports as to what sister white has done and received written if you desire to know um, what the lord has revealed to us read a published work 5t696 paragraph one praise the lord for that and it's a it's a part that uh, is very important in this discussion and, and basically, just like we read in early writings 220, in regard to what the devil has done to the Bible, we must also be very careful towards going to the extreme where we are going to get our hearers off having confidence in the Bible. And the same can happen to the spirit of prophecy. Um, why? It can happen in the spirit of prophecy when everything that seemingly does not agree agree with our time appears to be added without thorough uh, evidence given by us. And so it is our duty, one, to establish the confidence of our hearers in the Bible primarily, and then in the spirit of prophecy, the voice by which God has spoken to the remnant people and to the world at large. And so our burden is to give confidence because therein, in the word of God, the Bible is life, is power. And so we are going to ensure that we establish the confidence of our hearers, and especially those of them who have not even tasted into the Adventist truth. The first thing that I, I believe as a person is, and as a minister, is that my basic duty is to ensure that I establish the confidence of my hearers in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy. Because when we all begin our studies by throwing away segments of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, which appears not to agree with our uh, ideas, established ideas, or preconceived ideas, and um, uh, and perhaps say that that particular section is 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 added, or there's an addition there, there's a tampering there. Uh, the general opinion will be then it's we are not we are not going to trust this source anymore. And I think that has brought people to a point where, and I've seen many friends who have wholly rejected the inspiration of the spirit of prophecy. So we might think that we are all trying to we are all trying to defend one line of doctrine when you're actually pulling out one of the pillars of our faith, which is the spirit of prophecy. And that to me is, is something uh, that concerns me. It concerns me a lot. Uh, 
I would like to say, just as you people brainstorm on, on what you think about this, that when we are talking about edits or the tamperings in the spiritual prophecy, let us be sure that we have sufficient evidence. I know that one of the late, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, devotionals, uh, we all know it, uh, was it published um, in, uh, they were able to print it out in, is it in 18, um, I mean, sure, 1998 or some 1997, where they changed the um, uh, pronoun uh, uh, it to rather he. Uh, object, I mean, uh, objectively, I think because of the change of the theology about God, and so the understanding of who the Holy Spirit is, and they were thinking the concept of, of, of the personal pronoun it a, um, uh, uh, was actually bringing the analogy that the Holy Spirit could not be uh, a being walking just as the Father and the Son. And so they preferred to consistently use he, which they claim is biblical, but you see, if, if, if you're able to read, the mind is, while, while, while he is biblical in the context, of uh, in the context of of Matthew of, of John chapter 14 all the way to John chapter 16 where Christ gives this parable of the comforter but you can see that the mind uh, of the uh, of the person who actually did the uh, final edition of, of, of this little devotional actually had the mind that actually the church had once they officially adopted the Trinitarian doctrine so I'm thinking we need to have sufficient evidence. Now, again, it's also my feeling that as ministers and representatives of God's people, before we, um, we really talk about uh, tampering with certain sections, we, we, we must look. It's, it's, I don't think it's all about changing of, of, of perhaps a word or so, like we have the case of the great controversy, where we have the first great controversy in 1884, and that particular great controversy uh, is a little bit smaller compared to the 1888 and 1892. And what happens is uh, uh, the later versions ask more in terms of pages and information and the bulk also in terms of historical uh, realignment in terms of dates and so on. And we also know that this was done under the inspection of Sister Ellen White. And so she actually authorized the reproduction of those other versions that were later released. And so I do not have any problem with any of them, but I do agree with the concept that Brother Sammy was just bringing up. And what concept is that? The whole idea that it all depended with the targeted audience. Great Controversy 1884 targets Seventh-day Adventists. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we are not yet where we are. If you've not read the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, it's, it's very fundamental. For example, you have just cited the section which talks about the snares of Saturn. It, 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 in about three pages, which is not in the later versions, it talks straight to Seventh-day Adventists. It talks straight to us. It talks about what the devil is planning to do among a Seventh-day Adventist. It, it was it is not very important for someone outside there. And someone outside there would just do like, hey, if this is what's going to happen, where I want to go to, I might not even need to go. So I think that is why she had no problem with that section being removed and left here. But I know that there are some people who have taken the general wrong to have people distribute or read the other, the other uh, later versions of 1888 and the, and the succeeding uh, version. But I do not hold that position. And of course, I'm subject to uh, correction. I feel that for our people outside there, these other versions are very good for they set history right, which is very important for them. And they also set they have the right trajectory of prophetic trajectory, where we are coming from and where we are going to. We are going to a time where we are going to have the National Sunday Law Enforcement, and it's brought it out very clearly, and where we are going to have the time of Jacob's trouble, and then we are going to have Jesus Christ coming a second time and taking the faithful home. So I think the trajectory is all right, and there is no theological whatsoever disagreement that it has with the preceding version. So 
it 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 appears to me like it's a bit too stretching it further than it should be to insist that the other versions should not be read but to have a balanced view but also it's important for us as bible students to establish the faith of the people in the spirit of prophecy and tell them that they need to understand that God wants us as Seventh-day Adventists to study the 1884. Because there's a possibility that in emphasizing in the 1888 and the, the succeeding version that people are going to sideline what will be helpful for them so that we go back to Laodicea, where Laodicea do not see their true condition because I think 1884 mentions categorically our true condition as a people. And you've also talked about the compilation. And I think the compilations, as far as I'm concerned, we still need to have sufficient evidence as to whether they have interfered with what is in the original. If it has not interfered with I certainly have no problem with it in terms of context and the, the general flow of, 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 of our writing. Uh, um, um, in fact, I wanted to say on the matter of compilation, this is my idea and you can take it or leave it or correct it. I'm very free to correction, but I'm thinking that in terms of uh, compilation, every single one of us, when we give sermons, it is a compilation in one way or the other, because you basically pick here and pick there and pick there and pick there. And so if we rubbish every single compilation, then we must stop the issue of presentations and studies and sermons because they are all compilations, only that they are given verbally. They're given verbally. And so, but we must realize that when a sermon is given and we have quoted from one place or another, we must not insist if it gives a wrong concept about something, that that is the idea of the writer of that statement or that one paragraph. We must actually take that paragraph and interpret it in the light in which the author originally understood it. So I prefer if in a compilation, an idea by Sister White contradicts the general idea in our other writings that I find the original where it was once first written and then see if it completely agrees. And I think for me that that makes things really, really easy for me. So if it does not interfere with the general flow, the general outlook, the general understanding, then I would just praise the Lord. I would just praise the Lord, praise the Lord for what? Because sometimes we need the compilations. Brother Sonia said, look at the little book, Country Living. It's a simple compilation that helps us to go through uh, the, uh, um, okay. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's basically helpful to us because the little book country living is a compilation. And remember, it's a compilation that helps us to go through all our varied writings. I mean, points from the testimonies, from the letters and the manuscripts and from the, uh, uh, the science of the times, from the review and herald. And so it brings them together. Perhaps it's important for people who cannot study far and wide. And so in a holding just one single booklet, you can be able to go through a couple of the statements she's making on, on, on country living. And so in health and in education and in family life and in various other topics. So I don't think compilations are going to be rejected if, if, if we are balanced, but if it, asks, uh, it takes a trajectory which appears to be conflicting with a general opinion of what the Bible says or what she says in other books, then we have to take it to the original and interpret it. Of course, I believe still using even the Miller's uh, 13 principles of Bible interpretation. Uh, is there any other idea from any of us uh, to Fedali? Uh, brethren, um, Brother Cyprian, Brother Janius, Irungu Karibu Sana, we are discussing edits in the spirit of prophecy and 
what do you say about them? What should be our position? Asante. Maybe, Brother Zedok, before what you have just said slip out of my mind, and uh, to just bolster what you're talking about, compilation, uh, did E.G. White ever really uh, recommend compilations? And uh, the sounding answer is yes, but uh, on which grounds? A case is given uh, of uh, 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 one brother who was compiling her works. And uh, the case is written in one SM uh, from page uh, 58. Um, and she says this, and I hope we are writing down notes because these things we are saying in quick, uh, Brother Zaduk, you can help in uh, approving uh, those coming in. Uh, she says that I can see plainly that uh, should everyone who thinks he's qualified to write books follow his imagination and have his productions published, insisting that they be recommended by our publishing houses, there will be plenty of tears sown broadcast in our world. Many from among our own people are writing to me asking with honest determination the privilege of using my writings to give force to certain subjects which they wish to present to the people in a such a way uh, as to leave a deep impression upon them. And she says that it is true that there is a reason why some of these matters should be presented, but it will not uh, venture to give an approval in using the testimonies in this way or to sanction the placing of matter which is good in itself in the way which they propose. So she says that uh, the compilation can be made, but if it sticks to the context and the subject matter, as you have said, country living is. But if somebody wants to mix in their own thing, then she doesn't accept the testimonies to be used in compilation, and then her name stamped on it. And so she continues to say, the persons who make these propos propositions for aught I know, may be able to conduct the enterprise of which they write in a wise manner. But nevertheless, I dare not give the least license for using my writings in the manner which they propose. In taking account of such an enterprise, there are many things that must come into consideration. So while you are doing compilation, there are a lot of consideration that you have to do. For in using the testimonies to bolster up some subject which may impress the mind of the author, the extracts may give a different impression than that which the world were read in their original connection. So the issue of taking here a quote and taking here a quote, and then it is an idea of the author and not the context of E.G. White, and then write a compilation and put there E.G. White, he says that can never happen. And a good example is the book of evangelism, where actually we have the title Trinity when she never mentioned the word Trinity and then starts giving the quotes from different places without context. He says such a work should not be done. But if it is just to print out a compilation on what she talked about, the Godhead, and write there E.G. White without changing anything or adding anything, then she approves of that. And so she's, she says that there are some who, uh, who upon accepting erroneous theories strive to establish them by collecting from my writing statements of truth, which they use separated from their proper connection and perverted by association with error. Thus seeds of heresy springing up, growing rapidly into strong plants are surrounded by many precious plants of truth. And this way, uh, a mighty effort is made to vindicate the genuineness uh, uh, of the superior's plan. So people take titles and put their things that are out of context and then say that this is E.G. White saying. Such a compilation, she says, that um, uh, they should not come into place. And then you talked about um, uh, You Shall Receive Power, which was compiled in the uh, 1980s, that uh, it took out the it and replaced it with the he. And it was an agenda when there was a convention in 1980 to add the Holy Spirit as a third person of the Godhead, as the Father and the Son. And then they changed the world, you shall receive power from it to he. Such a way of compiling the E.G. White's writing, she say it should never have. In uh, MS 188-1907, of such a compilation, she, she says, they come to me 
that those that are copying my writings and say, now here is the better revised words. And I think I'll put that in. Don't you change one word, not a word, she says. The revised edition we do not need at all. We have got the word that Christ has spoken himself and given us. And don't you, in my writings, change a word for any revised edition. There will be revised editions, plenty of them, just before the close of this earth history. And I want all my workers to understand, and I have got quite a number of them. I want them to understand that they are never to take the revised word and put it in the place of the plain symbol words, just as they are. They think they're improving them, but how do they know but they may switch off an idea and give it less important than Christ means them to have. And now uh, uh, she says that uh, such a switching of words and such a switching of quotes from their context should never happen. But if we have to compile a book, let us say we are compiling a book on uh, 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 can relieving, let it be like the CL is. If we are compiling something on uh, 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 on uh, uh, on health, let it be as CD is and all that stuff. And then uh, maybe somebody may point to the history that was given that uh, Prescott and A.G. Daniels wanted to really change E.G. White's material. Now, I have met many people talking about that quote, uh, uh, that uh, historical uh, 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 reporting. But when you ask them, which material was Prescott and A.G. Daniels fighting to change in 1903, 1907? The people will never tell you which material that uh, these two guys wanted to change. But what Prescott and uh, A.G. Daniels wanted to change actually was our view on the book of Daniel chapter seven. And this led them to eliminate many statements from the book by uh, 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 Uriah, uh, by book by Uriah Smith, which is Daniel and Revelation, uh, where they eliminated many things. And even later, Prescott and Daniel were able to remove the section of Arianism from the book. But um, even when they wanted to change the historical context and the dates of the great controversy, there was a lot of caution and a meeting was held. And in the meeting was E.G. White, there was Willie White, and uh, the general conference committee about the dates. And E.G. White admitted herself that she is not actually a historian, but Willie White said that what she was shown was shown and uh, she could take from the history. And then it was the work of the church to establish the very dates of those things. And so when you hear people talking that A.G. Daniels and uh, William Prescott wanted to change E.G. E. White's material, Please ask them, what materials did they want to change? And show me how they were able to uh, change them. This is where I find that uh, we are somehow lazy in our submissions that uh, E.G. White's material was changed. Maybe something, lastly, I can speak about is uh, the compilation of last day events and uh, uh, selected messages, book one to book three. and. Uh, Last day events actually uh, really evades the historical context and the issues that deal with Seventh Day Adventists and how they will deal in assisting to in the formation of the image of the beast. And uh, selected messages, book one to book three, it is all about what was happening in uh, 1900 to 1907. And the passages are arranged in a manner that you will not understand actual what was the pantheistic history that was happening at that time. Now, when actually the E.G. White materials, people were really were tired of E.G. White and sent her in Australia for nine years and uh, they didn't want to hear her voice and uh, change some of her things. They were not able to do that. The Lord sent E.G. White back to uh, uh, USA and she was able to keep things in check. The, the only thing that, that happened after her death was the conference of 1919, where Willie White, they did not 
invite Willie White to that conference because they knew very well Willie White will not agree with what they wanted to discuss. And what was the matter of discussion in 1919? 1919, 1919, it was what part of the material of E.G. White is inspired and what part is not inspired. And what should, should her inspiration be viewed as the inspiration of canonical writers? And there were some of the things that uh, really Brother Holmes report in 1919 Bible conference that uh, I want us to just read uh, 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 to you. I think this will be my last submission today. Uh, the things that um, Brother Holmes reported in that conference uh, that uh, maybe can be of great interest when we are talking about the changes. The changes were not made. Uh, 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 unless somebody has something to submit that the changes were made actually, apart from headings being added in this compilation and all that, which we admit they are there. And the good thing that in this compilation, after they have added headings and all this stuff that EGY did not read, they are bold enough or they are good enough to give you where they have cited from, where, from the original material so that you may go back yourself and be able to read the original material. But I want you to see this 1919 conference, what happened and uh, what later uh, came to the church. And so this is Brother Holmes reporting. Uh, he says that uh, both Holmes and Washburn believe the 19 Bible conference discussion on the prophetic gift discredited the prophet and both believed they needed to defend the integrity of the spirit of prophecy. So in the 1919 Bible conference, where they wanted to issue a statement of the inspiration of Sister White, there are others who opposed it. And one of them was uh, Brother Holmes and uh, Brother Washburn. And so Holmes had a brilliant memory and was often called upon for spirit of prophecy references. In 1914, he borrowed and copied 300 pages of unpublished testimonies. Later, his name came into disrepute for issuing a protest against two teachers at Washington Missionary College for their teaching and light esteem of prophets' writing. He encouraged two others to do the same. All three were disfellowshipped. So with this background, we can understand the concern of Holmes when he learned of the plan to burn a large number of Ellen White letters. Thankfully, one of his duties was to turn the incinerator where they actually the material will be burned. When the time came, he stoked the fire to a hot blaze without much fuel. He let the coals burn down, but as he stoked them, they gave out a hot blaze. The men thought the fire was hot enough to throw in the spirit of prophecy letters and small books, and they did hundreds of precious pages. Holmes closed the door of the furnace, closed the damper, then shut off the air. The men stayed a while and seeing the flames around the papers were satisfied and they left. The material smoldered, but in a short time, the fire was smothered out. It was now possible to rescue most of the precious materials. Claudie Holmes kept the sign, the signed letters or the signed letters and books until he retired, knowing he would lose his sustention if it became known that he had done. When he retired, he gave them all to a Dr. Hayes. When the doctor died, his estate was deed to the conference except for his library and personal belongings, which were to be auctioned. Many had heard about the fire and were at the auction. The letters and books sold for $10, $25, and $50. Many still had burn marks on them. Then. Lastly, when this experience was told many years ago by Willard Santi, he had a number of the pamphlets in his possession. He also had a letter from the bequeathed estate library that tells the story. The letter may have been written by Claudie Holmes, although his name is not on it. The letter is dated 1957. It was printed in a magazine entitled Liberator, after which a brother from Colorado conducted Pastor Santi to confirm the event. This brother had been told by Elder J.S. J. S. Washburn what had taken place, as well as the name of the faithful custodian who salvaged the pamphlet. Later, the brother met Claudie Holmes and heard the story firsthand. Audio tape, Circle of Apostasy by William Willard Santi. 
today, those letters that were to be banned are known as special testimony series A and B written from 1890 to 1913. And if uh, you have a good memory, these are letters to do with education in the end times. All are short but contain much counsel to physicians, educators, and ministers, self supporting school and the health work. These are the things we see surrounding the conference of 1919 and uh, wanting to revive, revise if E.G. White was inspired as uh, the other prophets of the Bible. But because we had watchmen there, they were not able to do this. But uh, again, we have a uh, uh, little from coming later with the uh, uh, with the evangelism and the coming of the comforter and the movement of destiny, which are not E.G. White books actually, but compilation and where she mentions a lot about E.G. White, but there are things which are out of order. And so if uh, somebody says that uh, the E.G. White materials have been changed, what we are saying that um, well and good, may you bring your position, may you bring the changes and may you bring the original so that we may look at it. We cannot be naive that something has been going on, but also we cannot go to another extreme and uh, really uh, unsettle the people in the spirit of prophecy. My point, another one that was brought to us by, by Brother Brian Onango, which uh, I hadn't myself realized, and uh, you can check with it because this is the truth. In the new estate, and I'm now recommending the estate of 2008 and not the new estate. In the new estate, the, the preface that is written by E.G. White Estate is not now anymore in capital and uh, brackets to show that this is the preface by E.G. White Estate, but it is in small letters as even E.G. White's writing. So you cannot distinguish between, uh, is this a preface written by E.G. White herself or the E.G. White Estate? That also brings a confusion. And that is why uh, if uh, you are not comfortable with that because you'll be confused, then continue using your 2008 E.G. White Estate and you will not find this problem. Uh, bottom line, we have to become mature with what we are speaking and not be emotional so that uh, when things don't support what we think, we just dismiss them. And when they support what we support, then uh, we say, okay, now it is okay. That kind of cherry picking is of people who have not become mature in their personal studies. Thank you, brother. Uh, well, we we are so thankful. Uh, it's cold here. There's no power here. It's crazy. But uh, we're so thankful that um, uh, we are we are we are we are adding um um uh, in the right direction so far uh and um brother cyprian we praise the lord for uh what you just said and uh, it seems that you have the same thoughts uh, uh on the book i guess that's the book of evangelism and the ideas that brother sammy was bringing on on the same book evangelism which is our all uh uh, matter to be discussed, but we are thankful because it has been made brief as to why there are certain segments of book evangelism that has to be questioned. And it's because it shifts the entire theology, uh, foundational theology of the Seventh-day Adventist by um, inserting certain words as headlines. And those words actually um, uh, pattern the mind of the reader to think that Sister White actually had that idea, which is not the truth. She didn't have that idea of the Trinity while she's writing the truth. Neither she, did she have uh, uh, in any of her books used that word uh, in regard to defining uh, who God is. So I think that is very important. I, I would still want to say that the, the real issue is, is our duty uh, to establish the confidence of the people in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy, or to actually shake their confidence in the two great sources which God has given to us to lead us in the final uh, purpose in, in these words is to ask a people of God, as a people of God, to be both cut out and to be preserved. We need the word of God the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. 
And so there are times that we have actually insisted on a lot of tampering until we have actually made almost every other person doubt their authenticity and doubt their inspiration. And uh, they have shifted their confidence from uh, 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 the beautiful writings that God has handed down to us through to the prophets. I want to thank God for the writings of the spirit of prophets. And we have been having discussions late with, with certain brethren. I think it's on Facebook who uh, respectfully, I do not agree with, who have come to the point of thinking that Ellen White uh, plagiarized uh, her writings. And I remember uh, one of these fine times uh, categorically saying that I would be glad to follow on her because it takes a genius mind, a great free mind, to be able to copy all that, all that volume of work. I mean, uh, I've, I've gone to the university, I wouldn't do that. And that is sufficient reason enough for me, even if it's plagiarized, to believe that there was power even behind that. And also, it takes someone extremely genius to be able to do the copying or uh, plagiarism in accordance or rather by teaching the right theology that the Bible teaches on health principles, on education principles, on family life principles. They're helping millions and millions of people all over the world, across both, Seventh-day Adventists and non-Seventh-day Adventists. So I believe that the writings of Ellen White, they are inspired and they're sent from God to the church today. But when we push the aspect of uh, addition to the extreme, we shake the confidence of the people in the spirit of prophecy. Let me say this, I am feeling that it is not our burden. That is not our burden. Our burden is to establish the confidence of the people. But in case there is any tampering, we must, in the principle that God has given us in the Holy Scriptures, prove all things and hold fast to that which is right. How are we to prove? Use the Bible and her writings again. And so by the bulk of her writing, we are to identify if there is a tampering. Why am I saying so? Because there is a principle that we read in uh, early writings 2.20, which applies to scripture, but I don't think it applies less to spiritual prophecy. And what such principle is, is God's hand is upon the Bible. God's hand is upon the Bible to do what? To protect the Bible. So I think if God is protecting the Bible, which is handed down from him, from him through Jesus Christ, through the ministry of angels, to the prophets and the other writers, it can only be true that the same God who handed down these messages to Sister Ellen G. White has his hands protecting those rights. And and Brother Sammy has just read a, a beautiful experience. I lost part of it because I think I had a call that interfered in my internet. But basically, we have seen many books that have been written. And all of you can remember, we studied some sort of book, perhaps in Form 4 or, I don't know, in whichever sort of curriculum you went through in the names of set books. But they disappear with the time, despite the mandatory um, uh, the, the mandatory, I mean, said that we have to read them and go through them, but the writings of Ellen White still has influence. 175 years through ages, she still remains the best, white, most read American woman writer. So I think that the hand of God is upon the uh, writings of the prophet. Let me give you an example. You remember if you've ever read, uh, is it Second Kings 22? Uh, you remember the story of Josiah. And when you remember, uh, oh, it's First Kings, I guess. If you remember the story of Josiah, where the book of the law, the entire book of the law, it was lost because of the, uh, uh, the apostasy of the kings and the entire nation. But somewhere, somehow for reformation to be brought back through Josiah, for information to be brought back through Josiah, there had to be a tracing or a finding, uh, acquisition again, requisition of the, the book of the law. And 
the king took the book of the law and began to read the book of the law and read the book of the law and everything. And that actually brought reformation that was never seen. And remember, if you read through First Kings, Second Kings, First Chronicles, Second Chronicles, it's actually Josiah, Ezekiah, and we are talking about uh, Josiah, Ezekiah, Asa. These are the people that actually try to restore David. We are talking about David. The rest of the kings they messed up the nation, apart from people like Solomon who actually repented, and we are having Manasseh that repented. But one of the key issues here is Jeroboam, he actually messed the kingdom because he actually neglected the voice of God through a prophet, who at that time was actually the spirit of prophecy. And then in every other instance, if you've actually read through the history of Israel, what happens is God begins to bring this idea that every other king that actually followed of the generation of, uh, of, of Jeroboam, he said he did that which was not right in the sight of God as Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, did evil in the sight. So they were, every evil was almost, to a larger extent, being compared to uh, the evil of Jeroboam. Do you know what? Jeroboam, he rejected the counsels of the prophet when the prophet was warning him against establishing an uh, altar at Dan and at Bethel. And then Josiah, of course, in the time of Josiah, there's a restoration of the book of the law. The book of the law, of course, will restore a lot of things, the ceremonial sacrifices, all those things at the right position. And then there's a revival and reformation. And that actually uh, typifies what happens in the end of time. And there can be no true reformation if we do not establish the confidence of the people in the spirit of prophecy. And so I think that as a movement, as God's people, as a church, a Seventh-day Adventist, if we feel that there is an addition in, or there is a tampering with any line, any press, any single, which we think uh, brings a lot of controversy, one thing which our brothers brought up is very clear, we should be able to cite it categorically, and we should be able to return people to the original to the original so that the people who are listening to us and hearing us understand that this is what the original says so the confidence is still in the spirit of prophecy but when we basically throw um, words here and there what happens is we end up with the people who no longer have confidence in the spirit of prophecy and you know what happens in the last days the testimonies of the spirit of god will be made of none effect and this is one of the things that's going to bring a shaking in the Seventh Day Adventist movement. The throwing aside of the writings of Ellen G. Roy. And I think it's something that's worth thinking. Um, brother Zadok. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, and uh, talking about that, uh, I, I know many people have come into the truth about God recently. We, we have not come into the truth about God most of uh, us the same time and uh, i just want to cite two things on what you are saying about um on what we are talking about authenticated and uh, putting doubts in the people between uh, mm, between 2011 to 2015 there was a hot contest on uh, 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 and debate on some two quotes that uh, the E.G. White Estate had really added in the spirit of prophecy to prove the doctrine of Trinity. And I want you to see these two quotes. And uh, it really made people get unsettled into the spirit, uh, unsettled in spirit of prophecy. And uh, even others were thinking of uh, adopting, uh, going back to Trinitarianism. But thank God something happened in 2015. But I want to show you what was going on in uh, 2011 to 2015 about some two quotes, and I'll just put them on the screen. The, the first quote that was hotly contested is this quote in uh, uh, Australian uh, Union Conference recorder, which says that uh, the Godhead was stirred with pity for the race, and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit gave themselves to the working of the plan of redemption. In order to fully carry out this plan, it was decided that Christ, the only begotten Son of God, should give himself an offering for sin. What land can measure the depth of this love? And so 
people thought that uh, this is something that the EG White Estate had really done and brought it uh, so that people may think that we have three gods and it is a role play that Christ took uh, uh, to die for the uh, redemption plan. Another quote that was of great contention was actually the quote in 12 MR 260.2 which says before he left them, Christ gave his followers a positive promise that after his ascension, he will send them the Holy Spirit. Go ye therefore, he said, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, a personal being, and of the Son, a personal savior, and of the Holy Ghost sent from heaven to represent Christ. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. These two quotes brought a lot of problems, but thank God that after the push upon the E.G. White estate, materials were released in 2015. And the only materials that were released in 2015 were the original scanned copies and signed by E.G. White herself. And people wanted to see if these quotes were not added by the estate, but they were there signed and scanned by E.G. White herself. Uh, lovingly and uh, uh, most uh, uh, encouraging, this is uh, what we find in this uh, uh, quote actually. This is uh, uh, what we find in her writing of 2015 scanned and having her own signature. Uh, in uh, Let me just... Uh, Yes, you see, this quote was found scanned and with the E.G. White scan writing in letter 12, 1901, the first quote that was being disputed. Now it was found in the materials that were released. The Godhead was stirred with pity for the rest, and the Father, the Son, the Holy, uh, and the Holy Spirit gave themselves to the working out of the plan of redemption. In order to fully carry out this plan, it was decided that Christ, the only begotten Son of God, should give himself an offering for sin. What line can measure the depth of his love? The second quote about baptism that people thought that it was added, uh, it is uh, uh, the one Let me see. Yeah, this is it. Matt. This now was found in MS scan letters, MS 41-1897. Before he left them, Christ gave his followers a positive promise that after his ascension, he will send them the Holy Spirit. Go ye therefore, he said, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, a personal God, and of the Son, a personal prince and savior and of the Holy Ghost sent from heaven to represent Christ, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And so you ask yourself, what is this that uh, actually uh, was changed? When you look very keenly at 12 MR 260, it says a personal savior, when you look at MS41, it says a prince and a savior. That is the only change that is there. This is a quotation from the original, but the only change that is here, they don't add a prince and a savior, which is in the other writing. I, I hope you are seeing the screen and you see what is in the bracket here. The brackets are by E.G. White, but when you come to the son, it says a personal savior. But when you go back to the original, when you go back to the original, check out very clearly. Uh, just a, a minute. Yes, here it is. When you go back to original, it says a personal prince and savior. So what is omitted is prince, but a personal savior is there. So in the original, the prince is there. So I, I, I really repeat what I was saying earlier. If you know that there is a change in the spirit of prophecy, please bring, bring it out and from the original so that the people may be able to understand what is happening. 
And I don't see this conflicting with the whole idea that is being in, told in 12MR. And so down, uh, again, we come to the point that uh, can we humble ourselves when evidence is shown that uh, E.G. White said this and it was not added. Thank you, Brother Zadok. Asante, thank you so much again and uh, for the thought that you have given. And uh, I don't want to leave anyone without giving the idea. We have about uh, 18 minutes to the end of this uh, discussion on edits in the spiritual proxy. And so far, I can tell that we are agreeing that when we feel so strongly that there is a change, we need the weight of evidence. All right, any thought, any question uh, about this whole concept and this whole idea? Uh, Hello, Brother Zarok. Yes, Brother. Go ahead, Brother James. Yeah, I, I have a question. I, okay, I appreciate the comparisons given by Brother Sami. Uh, I have a question. Maybe I had missed uh, 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 like the first hour or something. So I, I wasn't, I, I'm still catching up and I'm happy that you're discussing about this. My question is really on the desire of ages when there is a paragraph that talks about combined with humanity that as it continues, it omits that Christ uh, is the, or Christ spirit is himself, the person. And uh, in the desire of ages, it's actually omitted. Uh, was there a change there or what effect does it have as a result? Because I know it's in 10 letter manuscript, letter 119. Is it 1897, 1895, paragraph 18? I think that's the one that talks about being cumbered with humanity. And then it continues to really define that the spirit of Christ is really Christ, but in the desire of ages, it is omitted. Uh, does it really have any effect? That was my question. Okay, as, uh, as that is being projected, I, I, would, I, would, I don't know if someone has a point, but I would say the desire of ages, uh, ideally to my understanding and uh, uh, the literary research that I've done about it, is it, it's in self sort of a compilation. But Brother Janius, again, the question is, is every compilation entirely wrong? Why? Because we realize that uh, there is the general view whereby people think that anything that is compiled is not right. Now, um, why am I saying the desire of ages to me is like a compilation? It's to me like a compilation because Ellen White was not basically writing a book called The Desire of Ages. She was not writing one single book called The Desire of Ages, like she was writing the great controversy and like she was writing perhaps the, uh, the uh, um, the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume One, Patrick's and Prophets, and uh, Prophets and Kings. What uh, uh, what I understand is she was actually writing the signs of the times, and perhaps in in other places about the entire life story of Jesus Christ. And then Marion Davis was actually bringing all these concepts together to make a whole uh, a whole idea of the life of Jesus Christ. And then so she brought all that together, and you'll find that not only in that statement, for example, the miracles that Jesus Christ did, he did through the ministry of all angels, but you see in the desire of ages, there's a word, all miracles there that is left, the word all is left out. But if you go to signs of times, the word all is there. So all miracles that Jesus did, he did through the ministry of all, uh, I mean, of every angel. But I look also at the concept, which I think I have missed to state. Ellen White also states, that in, in, in going through our writings, it's important to note time and place. So going by the issue of time, and here I want to, I want to look at this a little bit differently. 
uh, because people look at time in terms of context of what was going on at that time. But also we need to understand the time when, when these things will be, it's sort of ages, it's been published in around uh, 1898 when the prophet's sleeping. And while there are inroads which are being made of the original doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine number one and uh, number one, number two, especially of original uh, uh, fundamental principles. And today, two, three, four, five of the current Seventh-day Adventist church, the doctrine of God had not fully and officially taken hold of masses. And so they still believed that there was one true God, the only begotten Son of Jesus Christ, and they understood the Holy Spirit as the very life, the very power of God, they understood the Holy Spirit as the mind of God. They understood the Holy Spirit in, uh, I mean, in the right biblical uh, understanding. So I do not think that there was a hidden agenda behind the, uh, the warnings in the desire of ages or perhaps omissions here and there. I think it's just that as Marian Davis was bringing this together, she perhaps would have felt that she put it this way or that way, but I think that Ellen White endorsed what she was actually doing and recommended the book. And so I think that uh, it should not bring any difficulty. And if it brings any difficulty, we should just refer to the original. Uh, Sami, you have something which you put on, 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 on share and this, go ahead. Yeah. Brother Zadok, I want you to notice what uh, Brother Junior Sirungu is raising, but I want us also to look carefully at uh, how Desire of Ages puts the thing and how the original letter 119, 1895 puts it. And I like your idea that you are bringing out that E.G. White was not writing Desire of Ages. She was writing about the life of Christ and Marian Davis was commissioned to take the whole stories that has to do with the life of Jesus Christ and be, bring them together. But I want us to look at what Junius, uh, Brother Junius has uh, said, that uh, why did they omit it and does it have any agenda? In the original, actually that paragraph starts with, cumbered with humanity, Christ could not be in every place personally. Therefore, it was altogether for their advantage that he should leave them go to his father and send the Holy Spirit to be his successor on earth. Now you notice very well that Christ is saying that he will send the Holy Spirit to be his successor. And so she goes ahead in that quote says, the Holy Spirit is himself, this Jesus Christ, divested of the personality of humanity. That is the Holy Spirit is a distinct personality from Jesus Christ and independent thereof. He will represent himself as present in all places by his Holy Spirit as the omnipresence. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall, although unseen by you. This is direct from John chapter 14, verse 17. Teach you all things. So, uh, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. So things that should be considered, does desire of ages really negate that uh, the Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ uh, in a distinct way, independent thereof, or he, the Holy Spirit is not the representative of Jesus Christ. The original says that the Holy Spirit is the successor of Christ on earth. Now look at how Desire of Ages starts in 669.2. The Holy Spirit is Christ's representative, but divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. Now to be divested is to be stripped from something that you had. So from just that one line and, uh, only, it is enough to cover the other part that is in letter 119 in red that has been omitted in Desire of Ages, talking about the Holy Spirit being Jesus Christ divested of the humanity. 
Then now comes the statement in Zion of Ages, which quotes partly from uh, letter 119, 1895. And then the Zion of Ages ends by saying, no one could then have any advantage because of his location or his personal conduct with Christ. By the spirit, the savior would be accessible to all. In this sense, he would be nearer to them than if he had not ascended on high. And so the idea is brought that Christ is uh, represented by the Holy Spirit and he is omnipresent by that Holy Spirit. And so what is omitted in Zion of Ages from the original, which is letter 119, actually is covered by the first line in Zion of Ages. But if that is not enough, let us go back to Desire of Ages and see if that quotation was completed. Uh, uh, seen, uh, let us just go to uh, when, when this is um, Desire of Ages 669. But then the quote in letter 119 is completed in, uh, in Desire of Ages, page 671. And that is what uh, I would want us to notice. Maybe we have never noticed such. Uh, in Desire of Ages, what started in 669 and it's not completed from the letter 119 is completed actually in DA 671. And see how she completes, completes it. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agent of the third person of the Godhead, who will come with no modified energy, but in the fullness of divine power. And then it is the spirit that makes effectual that what has been wrought out by the world's redeemer. It is the spirit that the heart is made pure. Now look at this statement that has now been omitted on the other side. Through the spirit, a believer becomes a partake of the divine nature. Christ has given his spirit as divine power to overcome all heredity and cultivated tendencies to evil and impress his own character upon his church. And so in letter 119, you have this test that uh, the Holy Spirit is Christ divested of humanity. In DA 671, now you have the completion of that statement that Christ has given his spirit not another being but his own spirit and so it is just a matter of really reading the whole thing and putting it in context that uh, we, we we can really understand and so the bottom line brother juniors asked does this really mess up with the theology about the holy spirit not if you read until ds 671 if you stop at 699 you get another impression but if you go all the way to 671, now you have that part which is missing that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of Christ himself. And uh, I, I think that is how I solved uh, 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 the, the issue of DA and the original quotation in letter 119. Thank you. Maybe Thank you, brother. brother Junius can speak to us if uh, really he gets what uh, uh, I spoke. Uh, yes, you have answered it. And I, I appreciate because I had read all the way there, but as soon as that did hit my mind, I was like, I, why, why is this thing not really true or connecting? So I didn't follow all the way through to 671. And now that you have read that, I have seen, and I'm happy that you have shown that to me. I'm happy. Asante, uh, thank you, brother, uh, for uh, uh, Christ. Uh, being able to bind us together to give one mind. Um, we have about four minutes to go. And Brother Makini Manuel, you are basically, um, good evening, and you're wondering whether the changes that have occurred in the spirit of prophecy have occurred in the writings by the pioneers. Perhaps you came in late. And I would just want to recap as the, the host of, of, of this session, that we are generally, we are basically coming to the conclusion from this discussion that our our main our main duty our commission is to establish the faith of the people in the spiritual prophecy and where there are changes we must give clear evidence that there are changes in the bible 
in the spirit of prophecy. And as the Bible says, uh, where two or three witnesses, a matter shall be established. So we are basically, and we'll, we'll be able to handle this in, 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 in uh, we will be discussing element. We are not going to be like, and yesterday we were discussing about the 28. We are not going to talk about what perhaps Pope Ratzinger says, and we say, hey, that's sufficient evidence to have a say that that particular script is either inserted or perhaps that particular script is, uh, at, is tampered with. We need two or three witnesses to establish a matter. And when a matter is so established, we must look at what the other segments of the, uh, of the spiritual prophecy says and see if it does not contradict with the foundational teachings that are, are, are given there. So that's our key duty. And so we found out that if we go by that, then we find very little, uh, few which have been cited, uh, changes in the spiritual prophecy. We find very little. But we are not. There is, uh, there is no. Uh, there is none, uh, or rather, there is no. Uh, uh, what we call changes at all. There is certainly some changes. There is certainly some changes. So we've cited and we've given evidences about the writings of uh, of the pioneers. We want to say again. I want to say categorically, as brothers out of that. What I know is that the devil is wrath that has done to make war with the remnant to keep the commandments to go and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. But we must also remember that the hand of the Lord is always upon the writings of the scripture, the spiritual prophecy, and also I'm talking about uh, uh, the writings of our pioneer so that we can remember our history. So we, uh, we are not left without uh, protection, without guide. But if we say that there are alteration in those writings, we are not just going to say them for the sake of saying them. We are not just going to speak out of excitement and emotions. We are going to give evidence that this is what the original says, and I have the original. I, I, I have bought, <laughs> and I have here in my library, some of the original books, old as they were, to try to confirm some of these things. There, there is a lot of talk by brethren about things about editions and uh, removing of stuff and doing this and that. And most of these things are rumors. And remember when we read 696 of uh, the book, uh, uh, Five Testimonies, Volume Five, it was clear that we should not give rumors. It is actually wrong to give rumors. To give rumors of something Ellen White has said when she's not saying, and to give rumors of something like she has not said it when you don't have evidence, that's a rumor. So when we are talking about the writings of the pioneers, do you have evidence? If you had a preacher saying it, go find out from him. Please show me the original. I want to see the original because how did you know that this is the tampered version? I want to see the original. So when you see the original, because if I know something is fake, I do not need to know how the fake looks like. I need to know how the true is. So let us, in any case, as ministers of movement, if you're going to bind together, in any case that I have to show a congregation of people that this is false, and this is tampered with, I must show them what the right, the original thing is saying. If I say that this is wrong, I have to show what the right is. And so that's what basically we are saying. So I can say right now that no, they were not tampered with. I can say, yes, they were tampered with. I read them, but if I find that something is not right, I'll try before I just rush into discarding it or saying that it's added to find out what other portions of the scripture says. So uh, I hope that helps. But I don't know what maybe, thoughts of other brothers. Maybe, Brother Zadok, 
Right. Just be, because McKinney has asked uh, the issue about the pioneers and if uh, the materials have been tempered with, uh, I, I can just submit this. Uh, what happened in uh, 1888 to the meeting leading to 1888. Uh, in the week-long ministerial institute that preceded the general conference, two issues divided the ministerial force. And uh, a conflict over the 10 horns in Daniel 7 arose actually in that meeting. Then uh, you find this that uh, appeared actually side by side. Uriah Smith in the Review and Herald and in his book on Daniel and Revelation claimed that the ten's horn were the hands. Etty Jones in a science article stated that the ten's horn was the Aleman. Now, Etty Robinson reporting on this, uh, he says that Elders Uriah Smith and Etty Jones were discussing some features in connection with the ten kingdoms into which Western Rome was divided. One day, Elder Smith, in his characteristic modesty, stated that he did not call originality in view he had on the subject, that he had taken statements such as men as Clark, Barney Scott, and others mentioned, and drawn his conclusion from such authorities. In opening his reply, Elder Jones, in his characteristic style, began by saying, Elder Smith has told you he do not know anything about this matter. I do, and I don't want you to blame me for what he does not know. This harsh statement called forth an open rebuke from Sister White, who was present in the meeting. Uh, and uh, another thing that you find that uh, maybe people say that uh, it had been changed was uh, the view of uh, the early pioneers from uh, on Daniel chapter 8, from verses 9 to verses, uh, uh, verses 12. But again, you have to go back to the word to the little flock, which was authored by James White and Ellen White, and see what they say about uh, Daniel 8, verses 9 to verses 12, and see if in the latter materials, actually, they have been achieved. And so as Zadok continues saying, insisting that uh, let us be careful to say that this has been changed and we don't give proof. My brethren, I will encourage you to don't ever say that something has been changed and you don't bring that to so that people may see what is happening. Otherwise, you will unsettle the people in the testimonies and in the pioneer writings, and you don't want to meet that in the judgment. It better be that you supported them and you are in error than find that you unsettled the people and then they were lost. And so the bottom line is, can you bring the evidence that it was changed? Yes, if there is evidence, can you bring those evidence and uh, assure the people how it really affect the theology of the subject in discussion? Thank you. Brethren, uh, it's a good discussion. And perhaps I can only accept now final submission on the matter at hand and then we can be able to uh, wrap it up as we wait for tomorrow's presentation or other discussion. Good to have you all. If there be none, we are free to still submit questions uh, that we have in regard to the matters we are discussing. Tomorrow, we should be discussing, if I am not wrong, let me just confirm. Uh, for those who are watching, perhaps on Facebook, or just close, is that uh, tomorrow we are talking about uh, who has found it. I want to be sure I have what I'm telling. Okay, so tomorrow is day three, yes, and we are talking about the shape of the earth. This is really an issue. Uh, this is really an issue. And uh, wow, it's black out there. So we are talking about the shape of the earth as a tomorrow. And um, we are inviting you all, because this is an issue new to some of us, perhaps who are not, uh, who are not online. But let's come together tomorrow. Let's come together tomorrow and discuss because tomorrow it will be in your church. Tomorrow it will be there and it will be a controversial matter. 
So let's discuss if this is really salvational. And should we withdraw fellowship from those who do not see the same way as we do in regard to this matter? Otherwise, really, friends, this was a blessing, and I am so thankful. And we keep inviting you uh, to these meetings organized by Gospel Sounders uh, Ministry here in Kenya. And we hope to find more Bible workers within and without uh, uh, Kenya who are interested in discussing these matters together with us. I hope that it was a blessing to all of you and to Nasema Mbarikiwe. Be blessed. Amen. 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 I want okay. to praise the Lord. I, Amen. I, I want to ask for a prayer, a prayer from um, uh, one of the brethren. I don't know who is in a position to pray for us. Um, Tafadali. Aweze kutuombea. Nani ya tatuombea. Who is going to pray for us? Um, let me, Brother Timothy, are you in a position to pray? Uh, Cyprian is on the road, and I understand. So, sorry, it's, it's fine, brother. Perhaps he's not able to. I'll ask um, Elder, Elder Charles, are you able to pray for us to end this session? You just unmute, yes. Sure, you are unmuted now. We can hear you. We thank you for we thank you for everything. We thank you for this meeting. We have started this meeting well. We started it was started yesterday and we are continuing it well. We pray unto you so that we you guide us as you go through. Thank you for acting into our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amina. Uh, ndugu zangu uh, na watakia mema na shukuru kwa sababu mmefika hapa leo na mimi pia na shukuru Mungu kwa sababu amenipa nguvu niweze kufika hapa leo and so I am so glad and I pray that we will invite more brethren to join with us tomorrow otherwise Asante ni sana. Um, Asante. Asante. So, okay, take care. Ma. Bye and good night, everyone. Amen. Back to you, Sami. Thank you and uh, good night to everyone. Until uh, tomorrow, God bless. Amen. God bless too.